Chapter 8, Democracy. One of the first things I did upon turning 18 after signing up for selective service was register to vote. I was eager to be able to partake in the electoral process. It didn't matter that the primary election was four months away. I wanted to be able to say, I'm now an eligible voter. I had been taught that democracy was one of the cornerstones of the American Republic and that voting was a way in which I could let my voice be heard. Never mind the fact that my voice was an anonymous mark on a piece of paper that was thrown together with the voices of millions of other people and only a single vote would ultimately be heard, I wanted to make my uninformed voice heard. Not only would I learn that my voice is often not heard because I don't vote for winning candidates, but because decisions are generally not made in a democratic manner. Policy, for the most part, is not made at the ballot box. Rather, policy is made by men and women in legislative buildings claiming to represent the people. Not satisfied with simply casting a ballot and not seeing the results I preferred, I was told by a few people that the only way to actually change things is to run for office. The first time I ran for public office was in 2003 in Donegal Township, Pennsylvania. I collected 10 signatures to run for township supervisor, the equivalent of city councilor, as the only opposition to the incumbent. During the first interview I had with the local newspaper, I was asked, why are you running as a libertarian? I had been a libertarian for about four years at the time and never considered running as anything else, nor did I consider that I'd ever be asked why I was affiliated with my party of choice and responded, are you asking the incumbent why he's running as a Democrat? He replied that he'd never considered asking the question to a Republican or Democrat and pushed for an answer. I gave an answer about not feeling represented by the two established parties and believed in limited government. Ultimately, I spent $30 campaigning and received 11% of the vote. None of the issues I raised during the campaign were ever acted upon, and my voice was ultimately ignored. That, however, did not discourage me from running other campaigns, again, bringing issues to the table that weren't otherwise being discussed. Expanding the debate and spreading a message are two of the reasons I'm waging a presidential campaign in 2016. I still remember being taught in 8th grade American history that the electoral system of the United States was a combination of majority rule and minority right. However, as I read and studied history, I found out that the right of the minority was often discarded for the benefit of the majority. One could certainly look through American history and note the instances where the rights of a minority were infringed for the greater good. Internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, chattel slavery, forced segregation, relocation of Native Americans. To paraphrase Ayn Rand, the individual is the smallest minority. If the rights of anyone are infringed, you cannot claim to protect minority right. What does that mean? If you believe that no person has more rights than any other person, then no group of people can have more rights than any person because a person can't grant rights to another that they do not possess themselves. Since no group of people can have more right than any individual member of that group, no group can revoke the right of any other person or group. Therefore, any law, regulation, statute, or other dictate cannot rightly infringe on the rights of any person. Yet, that is exactly what happens in a democracy, whether it be directly direct democracy or a representative democracy. In practical application, democracy is a system in which a plurality of people who show up on voting day attempt to impose their will on everyone else. Allow me to pause for a second to say that I'm not opposed to voting as I believe that one can vote in self-defense. I am, however, opposed to the system that uses the threat of force to make everyone in a geographic area comply with the wishes of a few. If the joint opinion of the plurality changes in the middle of the term, in most cases there is no option for recourse. Why why then should people not have a manner in which they can let it be known that they do not consent to the ideas expressed by the local or national government? Why must everyone be obligated to live under the policies chosen by a plurality of people as expressed on a given day? The idea seems foreign to most people and they would likely claim it would never work or it's never been done before. Both claims are in fact false. Polycentric societies have existed in several places at various times throughout history. In Medina during the time of the Muslim prophet Muhammad, in Gaelic areas during the Middle Ages, and to a lesser extent in the United States before the New Deal when most people received social services from fraternal organizations or mutual aid societies. 
I long for the day when democracy, much like slavery, is viewed not only as a thing of the past, but also a system that should have never existed. I recall being taught that governments exist with the consent of the governed. It's even stated in the Declaration of Independence. Therefore, no government or society should be able to claim a monopoly over any geographic area, and every individual should be able to give his consent to and or withdraw his consent from any government at any time. At present, can someone choose to not consent? If not, how is this forced consent any different than a contract signed under duress?